you can uh, post your you can post your questions in the question and answer section and uh, when you are posting uh, your comments or question please identify yourself by your name and your organization so that we can recognize you Center for Environmental Education is a national institution established in 1984 as a center of excellence uh, by the Ministry of Environment Forest Government of India. As a national institution, we have a mandate to create uh, awareness on environmental education nationwide. That uh, uh, we do uh, through uh, several innovative programs and a capacity pro program. Also, uh, we aim that all of our education program, it is creating an action for sustainable development. So we have the commitment of over uh, 34 years in the field of environment education and sustainable development. And uh, though we have over uh, 3000 project executed nationally and uh, uh, internationally. So that uh, uh, since inception, we are doing in partnership with uh, several NGOs and community-based organizations. Also, we work in partnership with the several uh, local government, state and central government, also national, regional and international body. Uh, we are here today as part of this uh, United Nations Environment Program. And uh, so we, we work nearly 17 trust areas, starting from uh, education, sustainable rural development, waste management, sustainable urban development, biodiversity conservation, <laughs> so on. That, Actually, we uh, geographically, we, our headquarters is located in Ahmedabad, Gujarat. And uh, to have this program uh, 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 locally across nation, we have a uh, uh, presence in uh, all states uh, through our central offices, regional offices, state offices, and project offices. Apart from that, we have information presentation center and uh, national discovery centers and campsite. This is the glimpse about ourselves. Once again, we welcome you all. Let's move to the program. Hi, everyone. Good evening. And uh, this is Madhavi Joshi. And I am uh, working with the Center for Environment Education. And I'm based at Ahmedabad at the head office. I uh, just wanted to um, share one of the uh, an, a major campaign that we have just launched um, on June 5 and this year, and it's called Act to Restore. And the reason why we uh, felt it was important is also to align it with the UN Decade of uh, and Ecosystem Restoration that has been launched by UNEP and uh, by the FAO, basically that uh, the decade focuses on preventing, halting, and reversing the degradation of ecosystems uh, anywhere in the world. And it's very critical at time. Uh, it also aligns with the um, uh, target of achieving SDGs, which the countries have, are, uh, have committed to. Uh, so 2030 be has become a very, very important um, milestone for, a, for uh, you know, uh, focusing on not just restoration, but also preventing that becomes the first uh, um, level of uh, action that one needs to take. So therefore, we thought that it would be important to also look at ways in which we can engage a large number of people through a campaign. And this is called the Act to Restore campaign. Next, uh, Rajni. Uh, this campaign uh, we are doing with a number of partners along with, uh, of course, the uh, UNEP is, um, it is the UNEP campaign. So we're doing it with um, uh, a number of partners, which includes the Foundation for Environmental Education and a number of programs that we're doing um, as part of uh, the, these in schools and colleges. The idea is to um, look at uh, different types of ecosystems and understand uh, their, the, uh, the importance that these ecosystems have to this planet and why, and of course the issues that um, uh, in interventions or uh, disturbances um, create in these ecosystems. And also not just that, but share solutions uh, or best practices of by people by uh, and uh, good policies. So look at that, I also share all of that. Um, this particular um, campaign would look at, uh, would also, uh, 
the way it would get implemented would be through uh, various competitions in terms of what projects it could do and also uh, look at um, have quizzes and uh, other um, campaigns that would run from time to time and we will be posting about that ecosystem restoration has nine principles and these are very important to remember that these look at um, well-defined objectives that they need to be tailored to local context which is very critical looking at knowledge uh, incorporating all kinds of knowledge which is um, indigenous and uh, traditional and scientific and um, which is existing about that particular ecosystem and solutions that are uh, that are there uh, drivers and looking at drivers of degradation also looking at a long-term continuum of practices not just and also in terms of the recovery not a um, um, one year, two year, but it's a long period that needs to be taken, but also in different understanding that there are steps to, uh, to recovery and restoration involving people. And it's a very important uh, part of uh, restoration processes. And uh, so let me just keep it one for a minute. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, su support for the long-term um, impacts so that um, you can also, and also measuring results. So we can go to the next one. Just remember this slide and uh, we could share it also for with whoever is interested. Uh, the C Academy has uh, launched two uh, courses uh, this year uh, and we plan to launch some more, but the Ecosystem Restoration Certificate course and the Green Teacher Short Term courses. So the Green Teacher is focused at teachers and looking at tools and techniques in terms of teaching and learning about them. Um, sustainability and the ecosystem certificate course, uh, which we are part of, uh, and uh, and which is also launched on June five this year. Uh, can we go to the next one? Has uh, seven modules, and uh, we are right now in the second module. And uh, this particular course focuses again on various ecosystems, but the idea is also to look at an ecosystem from a perspective of um, understanding how, how its importance and uh, what are the issues and uh, knowing uh, what's happening on uh, restoration. In, and also a lot of questions that one has in terms of um, uh, um, knowing an ecosystem, I think those get, answer during these not everything can be answered because it's it's really complex but we are trying to get get a get a glimpse of what every ecosystem is uh, again there's also looking at interconnections because these are these are not silos so understanding that when we talk of restoration you're not talking about about say only a coastal or a forest but again if you're talking of forest it can it would be connected to a number of other types of ecosystems depending on what context it is in um, yeah, so um, thank you so much, Rajni. This is just uh, an overview I thought I should give about the academy and its courses and over to Rajni. Uh, yeah. Yes, thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Madhuri ma'am uh, and Rajni ma'am. Uh, so uh, good evening to all of you present here. Uh, welcome to the session here. Uh, now, just to have a brief uh, introduction to the forest ecosystem, we all have studied in our school days what is forest ecosystem and uh, we have even made some diagrams and things, but uh, mainly broadly if we have to classify uh, the forests of the world, then we can classify them as three different uh, types. One is the tropical region, uh, the tropical forest, then we have the boreal forest and the temperate forest. So these are the three different uh, types of forest that we can broadly classify them into. But uh, like uh, Madhvi ma'am mentioned, it's very difficult to, con uh, I mean, uh, cover everything in one small session. So uh, we have to dive in deep to understand more about the forest. And under these tropical forests, there are so many different types. So to look at all of that, you can always register to our course on the forest ecosystem module, and you will be able to uh, dive deep into it and learn in detail about these forest ecosystems, which are a treasure in our world. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next slide. And uh, just to have an overview about India. Now you all know that India is a very biodiverse uh, country. It has four biodiversity hotspots of the world, which uh, I mean, we should be all be very proud of because this is the only country that has four different uh, biodiversity hotspots of the world. Uh, and you all know that there are different types of ecosystems, habitats across the country uh, and different types of biodiversity exist there. So to learn all of that, it's, it's very interesting and uh, to have an insight, it, it's 
it takes a lot of time so it's it's a one month course with four different sessions some reading activities and some videos so you will be able to learn a lot about these forest ecosystem once you register for the model uh, but just to give you an overview uh, you can see on the screen a different type of uh, forest that we can classify uh, so we will move on to the next uh, slide uh, that is the different services that we get from the forest that is the uh, benefits of forest around us one and most important thing that they all provide uh, oxygen to us so without that we all cannot survive uh, but other than that it regulates the climate of the region and also maintains the air quality it stores carbon so every time it intakes carbon to produce its own food it's storing a lot of carbon from the atmosphere then uh, through its roots it checks the soil erosion recycles nutrients back into the soil and then uh, preserves genetic diversity see uh, forests are a bank of genetic diversity so maintaining so many different types of organisms their populations their individuality so maintaining that genetic diversity the forests play a major role in it and then uh, they provide a lot of provisioning goods it could be a lot of food products uh, non -tim non timber forest products like that there are different types of products that we are dependent on from the forests okay and also it you all know that without forest there is no water so forest help in creating rain and also recharges the <coughs> underground water when there is rain and also maintains biodiversity and now uh, we have a very short video uh, which just explains a little bit about the forest so let's take a look at the video forests nature at your service Forests cover one third of the Earth's land area. At the heart of humanity's life support systems, they perform vital functions that make our planet habitable. Without them, we would struggle to survive. It's well known that forests play a key role in our battle against climate change, storing carbon while sucking in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and locking it into their biomass. But what's less well known is that the products and services they provide are essential to every aspect of life. By regulating water for many of the world's rivers, they help secure water quality and supply nearly half of the world's largest cities, from Caracas to New York. They also help decrease the impacts of storms and floods, while helping control erosion. As the most biologically diverse ecosystems on land, forests are home to more than half of terrestrial species, from the great apes to the smallest of creatures. At the same time, they provide homes, security and livelihoods for 60 million indigenous peoples, while contributing to the livelihood of 1.6 billion people worldwide. The impact of forests reaches even further. In many developing countries, more than 80% of total energy consumed by people and industry derives from forests in the form of fuel wood and charcoal. Trade in timber and other forest products is estimated at almost 330 billion US dollars a year. The value of the forest multiplies as it's processed into a myriad of products used globally every day. Utilization of its genetic diversity enables progress in healthcare and science. For all seven billion of us, every aspect of our quality of life is intrinsically linked to the health of forests. Each of us can play a role in protecting this vital life support system. Celebrate World Environment Day and take action for forests. Register your I hope that was a very good introduction uh, to the forest ecosystems, uh, explaining different aspects, different services that we get from the forests and how we have to contribute uh, towards conservation of forest. So this <coughs> webinar and the course is also a part of Act to Restore, where we are starting to act and then create awareness. And through that awareness, we can all build and conserve the forest of our uh, surrounding. Over to you, Rajina. Yes, thank you, Vijala.
So that give a quite uh, uh, a glimpse about this particular uh, ecosystem, which is so delicate. And uh, let's see about uh, the sustainable development uh, goals. As we all know, this uh, sustainable development goals is also called as uh, global uh, goals. It's a collection of uh, uh, 17 uh, global uh, goals uh, framed by United Nations uh, in the year uh, 2015, and uh, which calls for the immediate action uh, from all countries, including developed and developing. And uh, India, in nearly 190 uh, countries are signatory, including uh, India, and uh, which is uh, uh, intended to uh, that we will achieve during uh, 2030. And uh, again, it's going to be a, a crucial year. Um, and uh, like in that uh, 17 SDG uh, goals, SDG 15 talks about life on Earth, including uh, forest. So uh, like one way, like uh, uh, like the man-made uh, impact on the ecosystem and other way, like a climate change uh, impact on this particular ecosystems is very much crucial. So uh, this SDG 15, is aims to sustainably manage forest, combat uh, desertification, halt and reverse land degradation and halt uh, biodiversity uh, loss. And uh, nearly like, uh, uh, like starting from 2000 to 2010, like uh, we have lost nearly 100 uh, million hectare of forest cover across the uh, world. Uh, India particularly, we have uh, 2.4 of uh, world's land area. And uh, within that, we account for 7 to 8% of recorded species in world. And uh, our government has, uh, uh, has taken an uh, step towards uh, this, uh, preserve this uh, particular ecosystem through many uh, forest management pro uh, program, afforestation and deforestation, uh, conservation, fuel wood uh, uh, consumption and reduction, wildfires uh, uh, prevention, uh, desertification prevention, and biodiversity and species uh, uh, protection. So one way like uh, uh, this, uh, we are part of this uh, uh, global uh, system. Uh, let's see like uh, as a national institution, uh, we also uh, have some uh, exemplary program. So that uh, I will see in uh, very brief. And uh, the picture you uh, see is uh, our office uh, premises. You see this Google aerial uh, pictures uh, differentiate between 1985 and 2010. So over the period of these two uh, decades, we could uh, be able to create a lot of uh, green cover. Uh, like uh, this is how our, uh, during the inception, our head office uh, used to be. So uh, we have nearly uh, 200 uh, uh, indigenous uh, uh, tree species. Also every year, uh, like uh, uh, we go on like many tree plantation uh, drive, not only for the uh, plantation, like uh, we see the sustainability of the tree uh, on their, uh, and their uh, maintenance. So that we, uh, whatever we try and emphasize people, like we see ourselves showing an uh, example to others. And uh, Sundarban, this is the one of the uh, salient program of our center. It's the Nature uh, Discovery uh, Center. It is uh, formally launched uh, during the year 1978 by Dr. Uh, Salim Malik. And uh, it's being recognized uh, as a mini zoo by the Central Zoo Authority uh, Government of India. And it creates a, a lot of awareness and action program uh, related to uh, reptiles and uh, uh, mammals. And it's for all age groups, starting from school children to uh, the retired and the senior uh, uh, citizens. And uh, every Sunday, this uh, awareness uh, drive is going on in the uh, park. And uh, we see uh, the visible example that uh, how, uh, during the course of time, we see the uh, like indirect reduction um, uh, in uh, killing of uh, uh, snakes by human kind. So uh, that uh, once again emphasizes the value of education that plays a, a major role uh, in humankind towards uh, nature. And uh, we have uh, camping programs uh, that's for all ecosystem we have across uh, uh, that we used to conduct uh, national and uh, international uh, uh, camping uh, program also we have. And uh, we have for forest ecosystem, marine ecosystem, mountain and desert ecosystem. And uh, this thing has started from 1979 um, itself. And this uh, camping program, uh, it's give opportunity to uh, people to reconnect and uh, sense the uh, sense uh, and experience nature and uh, uh, the uh, and learn about the particular ecosystem and the particular uh, uh, the services we are getting from the uh, ecosystem. And uh, we have a particular wild species uh, conservation education program. 
And uh, so the, these three are the salient one, uh, tiger conservation, rhinoceros <coughs> and dolphin. So through this program, like uh, how we give uh, the awareness uh, of the particular uh, species, also uh, for the conservation of the habitat uh, uh, for, for this particular uh, species. And uh, we have uh, interpretation program across nation, you can see from the map. So uh, here actually this, uh, uh, this we have in uh, national parks, sanctuaries and zoos. So we see this, uh, that the centers are not only for creation, it, create, it, it is becoming a learning center. So from that, that uh, who are going, uh, particularly the younger mind will catch up the action program, especially the positive action program towards the environment. So uh, we create during, uh, uh, through visual experience and learning habitat, uh, through uh, like exhibits and uh, uh, like a virtual platform uh, in this national uh, uh, parks and uh, sanctuaries. So it's a very uh, brief about uh, uh, our institution that we are doing for uh, uh, this forest ecosystem. So let's move on to uh, accuse. Uh, that is not aimed to uh, test uh, any of you. Like, uh, uh, let's uh, to see ourselves and uh, uh, bring up a platform for the common understanding. So let's have very uh, brief questions uh, to gather our knowledge. I think you will be able to uh, see the uh, questions. You'll be having five questions before you. Sharmin, if you can uh, read out the question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, a very good evening to everybody. So all the participants can actually see a poll that is made online now. And I can see like, you know, one out of 94 participants have started voting. There are a set of five questions available and very basic ones. So all that you have to do is uh, select the right option that you think is right and uh, submit. Yeah, don't forget to uh, click the submit button because unless and until you do not click the submit button, your answers wouldn't be submitted. So I hope that's clear. In case if anybody has doubts, uh, please feel free to put it in the chat box so we can address your question. That. And the quiz is uh, available for like another one minute, 20 seconds. So I hope that's sufficient enough for everybody to choose your right answer. My screen went blank. Oh, okay, okay, it's come back. It just went blank suddenly. All right, no problem. I'm back on track. No trouble. Ending the poll. Uh, so can we actually have another minute? I can see just 31 people have voted. Yeah, but uh, the time limit is uh, I'm sharing okay. the results. Okay, so. Okay, no problem. So we have our answers right now here. And um, I hope it's visible to everybody. The results are uh, available on the screen, right? Yes, Shabin. Okay, thank you, ma'am. So I'll be quickly uh, telling the answers for each question uh, so that everybody has a little, uh, uh, you know, clarity on why the particular answers. And uh, so the first question is, why is it, uh, what is true in an ecosystem? So the answer for this, like most of them have selected, 90, 19 people have selected the option C, which is producers are more than the primary consumers, which is actually the right answer. Because if you remember a uh, foot pyramid, the uh, producers actually fall under the lowest uh, 
line and that is because you know every time we move on the higher energy level the energy is lost at every tropic level so it is very important that the producers uh, are definitely more than the primary consumers and the second question is according to the survey by the moef cc the total forest cover in india is around and the right answer for this is 21% uh, so i see that a lot of people have answered 23% and 28% but the right answer for this is 21% the third question is which land based ecosystem is the richest in terms of biodiversity and uh, like i guess most of them have guessed the right answer around 26 people have um, actually chosen the right one which is the tropical rainforest and uh, like we know like the tropical rainforest are also a great hotspot for a lot of biodiversity and they also hold like um, 40 to 50% of variety of plant species so yes tropical rainforest are richest in terms of biodiversity when it comes to land but when you talk about the cor uh, coral reefs are the um, ecosystem with the richest biodiversity in marine life that's the difference and coming to the fourth question uh, what can you do as an individual to fight deforestation so the right answer for this is actually above all all of the above because leaves um, so i'll read out what are the above answers that are right uh, leave forest alone and plant more trees where space is available reduce uh, your use of products made from wood including paper and cardboard uh, demand forest products from sustainable sources and deforestation free supply chains so in order to fight deforestation it is very much necessary that we follow all the three things and the last question is which state in india has the largest forest cover percentage and the right answer for this is mizoram and i see a lot of people are confused between mizoram and assam but the right answer for this is mizoram and a small clarity on uh, the fifth question so uh, madhya pradesh is having the largest forest cover but when we talk about largest forest cover in terms of percentage it's mizoram which is 85.41% so i hope that clarifies sharmin can i just come in for yes, ma'am. For yes, a bit, ma just a quick clarification in terms of the question number four, where we're talking about plantation of uh, trees, and uh, it needs to be again depending on the context and where. So every ecosystem you can uh, would have its own uh, habitat and the type of you know trees and plants that uh, can survive there. So uh, one needs to be careful about. Uh, Uh, doing doing that so when you plant for instance if you're taking on a plantation i think do consult the ecologist in that area so that is something that needs to be just remembered so you can't go and plant something that you are doing in a tropical forest in a grassland for instance that's just wanted to clarify thank you very much sharmin uh, now we have a, a poster uh, for uh, forest ecosystem so uh, this actually uh, you can circulate uh, this to make ourselves uh, uh, sensitized and uh, you know uh, kind of uh, uh, conveying the message to others uh, so uh, like one way like we have this uh, global agenda and uh, you know the our nations and the government is also taking uh, the step towards uh, the restoration and conservation so uh, like we see ourselves uh, uh, you know uh, like how individually we are contributing for the conservation that really matters uh, we couldn't uh, see the result immediately but uh, definitely the whatever the seed and whatever the steps we take uh, we will see the result in future so uh, the choices we make and uh, the voices uh, we uh, disseminate and uh, the actions we uh, do in our daily life it's really related and uh, it's uh, it's either give the negative impact to the environment or to uh, it will give the positive uh, impact to the environment so uh, for this uh, uh, forest ecosystem like uh, we put forth uh, uh, to the idea of choices that we can choose to support uh, non timber forest products by local community so uh, that way like uh, we'll be like uh, uh, you know proactively contributing for their sustainable livelihood uh, 
also for the conservation of this uh, non timber forest products and uh, secondly like wherever you are and uh, whatever uh, you are and uh, you can organize uh, audit session by uh, involving uh, an expert or forest officials uh, that way like you can disseminate uh, uh, this idea uh, to your uh, uh, friends uh, uh, colleagues and uh, uh, your uh, neighborhood that uh, you'll be able to do and uh, coming to the actions you can be a volunteer and uh, you can be a part of any local uh, organization for this plantation drive and uh, when you choose for this campaign you can be a responsible uh, camper so uh, that's what we were like uh, we were uh, trying to uh, communicate uh, to you through this uh, poster and uh, we have now one case study uh, placed uh, here. Uh, I ask uh, my colleague, Mr. Prajla, to explain that. Uh, thank you, Rajni uh, So it's just a small case study uh, which we have taken for the restoration of forest ecosystem. Uh, I'm sure you would have seen a lot of videos and read about a lot of articles about uh, restoring forests across the country. And uh, this is one small example that we have taken to share it today with all of you. Uh, so this is happening uh, in the town of Moodbidre uh, in Karnataka. So this is a small town where there is a college called Alva's uh, Education Foundation in their engineering college campus. There was a two acre land which was to be a football ground, uh, which uh, they wanted to create a forest there because there are a lot of birds and uh, other organisms that live in the vicinity. But uh, these days they see the trend of declining population for all these organisms. So they wanted to uh, give a space for them to survive. So they have decided to dedicate this two acre land within the campus uh, towards the restoration of forest. And this started in the year 2017. Uh, if you see a football ground, the, the soil is very loose and uh, if there is a proper rain, then all the soil will be eroded. So what we planned is uh, we looked at uh, planting some buffalo grass there uh, to stabilize the soil. So initially that helped a lot. And also with the rains, we tried uh, planting a lot of uh, indigenous species of uh, trees, uh, which fruit and flower. So uh, the main uh, goal was to attract a lot of bird species as birds are studied as bioindicators across the globe. Uh, so we started this work in 2017. And uh, right now it looks like a full fledged forest. Uh, if you're interested to know more about it, you can always get in touch with us and uh, we can share the pictures and the articles about it. So uh, similarly, there are a lot of work that can be done uh, at an individual and as a community. So uh, I request all of you to take up uh, studies like this or uh, choose a small area with around you and then dedicate it for the forest for the other organisms to survive. And eventually, once the forest develops, even we will be benefited uh, because of the forest near us. Thank you very much. Thank Over you, Vijla. Well. Yeah. Yes. And now it's the time to welcome our eminent speaker, uh, Mr. Preston Ahimas. And uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to have you, sir, uh, for this uh, uh, webinar. And uh, introducing uh, Mr. Preston Ahimas, he has a vast experience in the area of wildlife and conservation over the period of last uh, uh, 40 years. And uh, for him, like, uh, like anything related to nature uh, uh, is kind of his interest and uh, action, particularly uh, uh, spiders and uh, 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 like reptiles. Uh, butterflies and uh, birds and uh, he took a uh, like professional experience uh, professional training uh, in uh, jersey zoo uh, in the uk also uh, smithsonian in, uh, institution in the uh, usa and uh, he has uh, uh, like uh, he is the pillar for this uh, Tamil Nadu state office of worldwide fund uh, for nature and uh, also he has uh, developed this uh, uh, national nature conservation uh, camping center for the WWF uh, uh, India and uh, eventually like uh, yeah, he is uh, he was heading the environmental education section of this uh, Adair restoration center uh, in Chennai uh, presently he is a forest consultant uh, for the Stevier motor company. Uh, he's also a writer. He writes uh, uh, like uh, uh, books and uh, articles related to wildlife and uh, uh, conservation. He's the author of uh, uh, three books, uh, 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 namely like Birds of uh, Madras, Spider and Introduction, and a guide to some urban uh, fauna of uh, India, which is a help for uh, uh, many, uh, particularly who are living in urban, to uh, identify uh, the creatures uh, uh, surrounded us. And uh, uh, he is also our vocational excellence award uh, during the year 1994-95 of uh, Rotary Club of uh, Madras Metro uh, for his eminent work towards uh, the preservation of ecosystem. Uh, a warm welcome, Yuta. 
Over to you. Thank you, Rajini. Um, I think we can go to the PowerPoint presentation right away. Yes. Can we start the PowerPoint? Yes, yes, yeah. Is it visible now? It hasn't opened yet. You can just see the screen with the ticket, but not the ticket. Hello, Sorry. you start start the PowerPoint first, minimize the Zoom screen, start the PowerPoint first, then you share that. Yeah, you you, uh, you open the PowerPoint before sharing first. the screen, you open the uh, PowerPoint resume. Yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing. Yeah. And, and then it will show you all the windows that are open and you can share the, you can uh, choose the presentation slide. Yes. Okay. All right. So we know that the natural environment is under tremendous pressure. There's no doubt about this. From all sides, it's being attacked by the human agency. In fact, the WWF Living Planet report of 2020 said that nearly 68% of all biodiversity has declined in the last 50 years. So we've lost some 68% of biodiversity in the last 50 years. That is a huge amount and something that we can't afford. And it's very important, therefore, in order for our planet to carry on to uh, keep living, we need to reverse this trend or at least halt it. First we halt it, then we reverse it. So we can move to the next slide. The thing with us is progress is always on our minds and we are forging ahead with progress at the cost of nature. There's this human juggernaut that is simply diving into forests, into wildernesses, into ecosystems, tearing them apart for the sake of development and progress. Now this is, development is of course needed, progress is of course needed, but not at the cost of the ecosystem because the ecosystem is what we are living on. It's the platform that supports us. We can't cut the branch that we're sitting on. So we need to protect it. We need to go ahead, yes. We need to progress, yes. But we also need to support the, 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 our, our uh, living platform. Now, the ways in which we damage our ecosystem and destroy it are varied, all in the name of progress. Unfortunately, all this is important, but there are ways and means of progressing, like I said earlier, without totally damaging the ecosystem. We just take a look at the ways in which we are damaging first and then what we can do to reverse it. We can move to the next slide. Yeah, so dams, these are one of the oldest and the most destructive uh, activities of man. Now dams are required for the progress of a country because they are the cleanest form of electricity production. There is no uh, fuel used and there is no emission. But the problem with dams is they are built in the middle of a forest. They have to be built where there's plenty of water and you don't get water in the middle of a desert, you get water in forests. So forests are the places where dams are situated. To build a dam, you've got to devastate a huge area of forest because the dam wall has to be built there. Material has to be brought in. Thousands and thousands of people have to be kept there. They have to be uh, looked after. They have to stay there during the construction of the dam. And once the dam is built, the reservoir behind, the, water, the rising waters behind drown out huge areas of forest. So dams can be very destructive, but they're important. So what do we do? Another area in which we are damaging our ecosystem is this, is open cast mining. Again, this is something that is required for the progress and economy of the country. We need mines, but the ways in which we're doing it, especially open cast mining, as you can see in that picture there, simply tears into the land, opens it up, devastates it. Let's move on to the next slide and see what else we're doing. Housing, we gotta live. People need place to live. Most places are already occupied. So whenever new land is required for housing, it's taken from forests by and large because forests cannot protest. 
other lands are owned by people already, so they protest. Forest lands are taken over, housing comes up there. Along with housing comes all the associated problems with population and waste production and garbage disposal and whatnot. Another problem is agriculture. It's a problem and a requirement. We know that agriculture, without agriculture, how can we live? We need food and agriculture provides most of it. But agriculture requires fertile soil and the most fertile soil is found in forest areas. And again, because forest areas are not already occupied, those areas are taken up for agriculture. After some years of practice of agriculture, the soil gets depleted, so a new area is selected. Then you have timber, as you can see in the other picture. Timber is the most direct attack on forests because it is eating away forest for the sake of the forest itself. The other attacks are they're all indirect, but this is very direct. You actually remove the forest itself for the sake of the produce of the forest. Road building, another problem, very essential. It is required for the progress of the country. You have to transport man and materials from one place to the other. So you need roadways and railways. But both of these can be very devastating because they are, when they are built in, an, in a forest area, they open up the forest to infection. As long as the forest is closed, it is attacked only from the outside, along the periphery. But when you build a road through it, you enable infection and decay to start from within the forest. So now the forest is attacked from within and from outside. A big problem. Industry is the most important aspect of any developing country or developed country because it is a sign of progress. This is where we get all our materials from. Every one of us depends on industry for all our needs. Everything that we do, everything that we use comes from industry. But unfortunately, industry also damages the environment considerably. But industry, it's ironic that industry is the very entity that can actually protect and rebuild the environment, as we will see in the next the following slides. Now, it's, it's, it's true that we need land, so we go and take it wherever it's available, mostly forest land or land that is not particularly used by people. But just because it's not used by people, it doesn't mean to say that that land is not required. It is, it is useless wasteland. No, it is being inhabited, already inhabited by some creatures, by organisms, and it has an ecosystem functioning there. Now we go in there and we push out that ecosystem. We push out the inhabitants of that place. But this sometimes cannot be helped. But can't we, instead of simply booting them out entirely, can't we at least share that land with the original inhabitants? If you look at the next slide, you will see that this can be done. It is possible. It's happening. In that picture, you see building, high-rise buildings in the background, and you see birds in the foreground. So here, what we've done is we've gone to that land, we've built, we've taken it, we've uh, built on it, we're living in it, but we're sharing it with wildlife. This is the important, sharing the land, not just simply grabbing it, kicking out the original inhabitants and uh, usurping the land. Next picture. This kind of sharing and rebuilding and rewilding that is, you see, you take land away, but then you give some of it back. You enhance it. You make it better and give it back. This can be done best by industry. We saw earlier that industry was can, can really damage an ecosystem. But here we can see that industry can revitalize it, can rebuild it, can rewild it. And industry is probably the best entity to do this because industry has the three tenets, or at least two of the three important tenets of conservation, which is space, and funds. These two are essential, they're crucial. In addition to space and funds, if the intention to conserve is there, we've got it made. Industry has space, industry has funds. If industry has the intention, that's it. You have conservation in place. Next picture. One of the, one of the big industries of our country, of our, in fact, in Tamil Nadu, which is doing exactly this, is the TVS Motor Company. And the TVS Motor Company and Sundaram Clayton Limited, both of which are chaired by Mr. Venus Srinivasan, who is an ardent conservationist and a, uh, a keen wildlifer. In his uh, properties, in the properties of these factories, it has been mandated that 15% of factory land will be on the forest. Now, there is already a government mandate that says all factory lands have to be under greenery to the extent of 30%. 
but the mandate does not specify what kind of greenery. It just says greenery. The easiest kind of greenery is lawns, flower beds, prune trees. It's very easy to keep them, to make them look nice and pretty, and that's it. You've got your 30%. But TBS says, through its chairman, that 30% is not all good because that's, it's like a green desert. It does nothing for the ecology and the local wildlife of the land. The wild forest alone can do this. So half of that green area has been put under forest. And what you're seeing in the picture is Okay, is uh, no, the, the, the previous one, same one. Just keep, stay on the same picture. Yeah. This is a pond that has been developed in the Hosu plant of the TBS Motor Company. It's packed with birds, painted stalks are breeding there, one of the largest breeding colonies of this bird in the region. Lots of other birds, gray herons, cormorants, darters, and a whole lot of other creatures like snakes and woodland birds and jackals, yep. jungle cats, all kinds of things living in these forests. Simply because the forest has been created there, made wild, and these animals are welcomed there. Next picture. The next picture shows you. Can we move to the next picture? Yeah. This is what some of the factories of the TVS Motor Company and Sundar and Clayton look like. This looks more like a forest than a factory. But the reason is, this is only a portion of the place which is under forest. And the forest that you see is dense, it's thick, as you can see, and it harbors a lot of wildlife. So although this is a manufacturing plant, it also is enhancing and enabling animals and wildlife to live there. This is what industries all over should do. If one industry can do it, other industries can also do it. And because I said industry has the capacity, it is imperative that other industries also should follow suit. Next picture. At the TBS Motor Company and Sundan Clayton factories, wherever there's land available, whenever land becomes available, whenever a new factory is set up, land is automatically set aside for afforestation. Immediately saplings are planted, saplings of the right kind, or native saplings, and they are nurtured, and they grow quickly, and soon we have a forest right beside a large manufacturing unit. Next picture. Water is essential in any forest. You can't have a forest without water. So ponds are also made, created, they're dug, and uh, if enough rainwater doesn't fall, then groundwater is pumped and pumped up from the ground and pumped into the ponds. So although a factory needs a lot of water, water is nevertheless set aside for filling the ponds because the water from the ponds nurtures the forest and brings in the wildlife. Next slide. Now, when you have a pond, you have to look after it. See, it's not, it's, it's not, it's easy to say, yeah, we, we want to have forests, we're going to have forests. When you create a forest, it's a man-made forest. It has to be looked after. It's not a wild forest that can look after itself. So man-made forest has to be managed. And in TVS Motor Company and other places where this should be practiced, it is imperative and essential to look after this forest. So the water bodies are aerated in order to oxygenate them and in order to prevent algae formation, which deoxygenates the water. Food is put into the water, fish, snails, and other things that birds and animals eat. Next slide. Next picture. We also encourage, it's important if you're bringing animals in, they should breed because breeding is an indication that animals are getting all that they need. All their needs are being provided and therefore their forest is a successful one. So we encourage animals to breed in our forest. We put nesting baskets up in trees. We put nest boxes in trees. We build little stone shelters so little animals like snakes and mongoose and small creatures can live and breed in them. It's essential. When you see a breeding animal in your forest, you know you've done the right thing and your forest is a success. Yes, next one. Uh, an important part of any rewilding program any reforestation or any return to nature program, which is what we're talking about now, is the prevention of invasive plants. Invasive plants are robust. The fact that they're invasives means that they can, they come in, they take over the land and they snuff out the local flora on which local wildlife lives. Because they are so robust, they don't allow the other plants, native plants to grow and since they take over the land and, and you have a monoculture of a plant that is of no use to local conditions. So removal of invasives is very important. You have to keep doing this because the invasives are tough. They keep coming back. You've got to keep removing them and keep rewilding it, the place with native plants. 
if you remove an, a non-native, an exotic or a, an invasive and leave it, they will return. So you've got to replace them constantly, continuously and frequently with native plants after removing the invasives. Yes, next one. Also, if you want to have wildlife within your premises, you must enable them to move around. You can't have them restricted in a place. You can't build a wall around them because wildlife is not used to being confined. They need their freedom. They need to move around for proper healthy genetic exchange. All that is required. So you cannot fence them in or completely contain them. You have to enable them to move. And this is done by making little passages. Every factory will or every premises has fencing. But you must allow, allow animals to move through that fence. So we create little openings like this in the fencing. Little small animals to move through. Fence is mainly meant for people and for vehicles, to, to prohibit people and vehicles, not the small wildlife. So we keep these places open for little animals to move through. And this should be done everywhere. Now, when you build a forest, you can't say, I want only this type of animal to come in, and I don't want that type of animal to come in. When you make a forest, when you create a forest, when you create an attractive home, everything is going to come there, including snakes. The problem with snakes is everybody thinks that all snakes are venomous, although 70% or more snakes in our country especially are non-venomous. But the fact that a few are venomous make, gives a bad reputation to all the others, and they're killed or driven away without second thought, saying that well, it's, an animal, it's a dangerous animal, it's venomous, kill it or throw it out. But if you're creating a forest, then you have to allow snakes in. And in our forest at TBS, we have signboards telling people that they should not disturb snakes, should not kill snakes. And in fact, the signboard that you see on the top left corner of your screen, it's in Hindi because this is in our factory in Himachal Pradesh. The, the, the signboard says, don't kill snakes. Killing snakes is a sacrilege. Mahapap. Mahapap hai. That means killing a snake is a great, grievous sin. Now, snakes can't read. So you can't put up a signboard saying snakes not allowed in our forest. You have to let them come in. They will come in. But if they come into the working areas, you need to contain them, capture them, and release them back into the forest. That's what we do all the time. The TBS forests have the, the security are trained in the capture of snakes. They're trained to capture snakes that move into the working areas, and they're releasing back into the forest. So this is some, these, are, these are all things that have to be done and followed and practiced if you want to do a rewilding program at your place. Next slide. Next slide. In order to, you see, different habitats attract different, a different cast of wildlife. There are animals and birds and creatures and insects that are habitat specific. Some of course can live in many different types of habitats, but some require specific habitats. So we try, try and provide them too. This must be done everywhere. You must provide as many habitats and as wide a variety of habitats as you can, so that more animals can come in and benefit from the protection and the enhancement that you're providing. We have butterfly gardens in our factories, and it's very easy to, put up, to come up with a butterfly garden. See themselves have a butterfly garden. Butterfly gardens not only attract butterflies, they, to, they attract all kinds of insects. And when you have insects coming in there, there are a lot of animals that depend, that feed on insects, birds, uh, praying mantises, spiders, scorpions. So you have a host of creatures coming in, zeroing in on that butterfly garden because of the few or the, the flowering plants that you've planted. It's a connected thing. You plant plants, flowering plants, butterflies come in, butterflies, other insects come in, flies, bees come in, they're fed upon by others. So you get a whole lot of animals zeroing in on that butterfly garden. And you have a nice, uh, good diversity of wildlife there. Next slide. There are other kinds of, yes, please change. There are other kinds of micro habitats or mini habits, habitats that you can create. The grassland is a very important habitat because grasslands provide a lot of shelter for the small animals like snakes, mongooses, ground-dwelling birds. All these creatures need the, the grassland habitat because that provides them its shelter. It's thick, it's penetrable, at the same time, it shelters them. It, it is protective. And grasslands, if you mix them with millets and uh, sunflower or so many other crops, you can attract birds to feed on them. So you're not only providing a shelter for wildlife, you're also providing food. So you bring in further wildlife. So grasslands are an important mini habitat that you would like to create in your factory or in your estate or in your ground, wherever, wherever you have space. Next slide. Bullrush marshes 
are critical and important for birds like whales. White-breasted water hens, purple swamp hens, common moor hens, all these are ground-dwelling birds, but aquatic at the same time. They stay on the ground, so they need thick shelter on the ground, but with a lot of water in it. And that's what bulrush marshes provide. That's what you see on your left hand top corner of the, of the screen. That's, that's a bulrush marsh in one of our factories, our Sundaram Clayton factory. On the right hand side, you see a dry habitat. See, scrub is an important ecosystem of its own. Just because it looks dry and thorny and stony, it doesn't mean to say it's wasteland. That's the trouble with most of us. We think scrubland or wetlands are wasteland. They are not. They're important, diverse eco ecosystems on their own. And they support a different cast of wildlife of their own. So we have created dry habitats also. This is, that picture is taken in our MISO plant, a TVS Motor Company MISO plant, where we have a dry habitat. We built it. You've got thorny plants in there. It's open. It is dry. In summer, it is bone dry. And you have wildlife coming and living in there. We also have created sand pits for sand living creatures like sand boas and skinks. Next slide. Now all this, all this is great, it's good, it's important, it must be done and it can be done largely by big companies which have the land or big estate owners. If you have a big estate or a big garden or a big huge uh, uh, a farm, you can do all this in those places. But more than just doing this, it is important to tell people why you're doing it, what's so important about it, why it is, why it should be there, and how they can contribute to it. So we have education programs also in our factories. I mind you, these are factories where motorcycles and car parts are being produced. Side by side, we're building a forest, we're creating forests, we're attracting wildlife, and we're telling people, we're bringing people in, telling them why they should conserve wildlife and why it's so important. This is something that everyone should do. All factories, all companies, everybody who has land, to do these things in order to rewild it and to make it eco, uh, eco viable. Next picture, next slide. So there you go. You have land, you use it for your progress, you use it for your development. You have to have progress and development. But side by side, if you can raise a forest, then you are not kicking out the original inhabitants of that place. You are sharing that land with them. In fact, you're making it better. Because within your premises, that forest is protected, whereas outside it is not protected. So the animals living in there are now protected. They have water. They have thick, lush forests. They have food. They thrive. And this is something that all of us who have the land and have the funds should and must develop the interest and the intent. This is what we should do in order to bring in wildlife, rewild the area, and save the ecology and, eco and uh, ecosystem of that place. And next slide. If all of us can do this, Next slide. Can you change it? Yeah. If all of us can do this, we can have a healthy ecosystem around us. And remember, I told you in the beginning, a healthy ecosystem is what supports life, including our own. A healthy ecosystem supports us. It supports our activities. It supports our industries. It supports our all that we need that is required for us. It also supports other forms of life that share the planet with us. It's important that we rewild areas. If we take areas, share it with the local wildlife, give some of it back, enhance it, protect it, and then we'll be really doing our job for a healthy planet. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, sir. We do have a few questions for you. In fact, we have many questions for you. Right. So, uh, this is in the Q&A, you can uh, see it. I will also read out uh, the questions to you. So, All our right. first question is from uh, Dominic Samuel. <laughs> so, he's actually a combination of three, four questions. He would like to know from you, uh, how do we protect or ensure that our local shrub, forest and water bodies surrounding it are preserved? What measures do we have to take to involve government more actively in this process? And he also thinks that ecotourism uh, is very popular and people do choose to go to tiger reserves, but how can we, uh, and we neglect uh, the small forest at our backyard. So how, what can be done about this? So uh, it's actually three questions, so. Okay, all right. Now, small forests, which are largely shrub forests that surround our areas, our living areas, they are all property of the government. I, we, I was talking largely about forests that are within our premises. Which way, so we can enhance them, do what we want, protect them, build them. 
when you talk about forest that belong to the government, you can you can't go in and do what you like, but you can encourage the government, help the government, and assist the government in doing what is right. The government knows. The forest department knows. Sometimes they are handicapped by various uh, issues. That's where private individuals or private organizations or institutions can step in and offer assistance to the government. You can offer, uh, sometimes the government, the forest department is willing to take suggestions and they are willing to implement them. On your own, an individual or uh, an institution, institution cannot do much when you're talking about forests that surround us because they don't belong to us. If you have a large garden in your own backyard, you can do what you like. You can in enhance it. If you have a large estate, you can enhance it. If you have a farm, you can enhance it. But government forest has to have the participation of the government. And so it is important to work with the government to do these things. We can't work against the government. We shouldn't. So the government is there to, to help the citizens and the wildlife and the ecology and the environment of the place. So we should join forces. And this is a, a, a cooperative effort that we should involve ourselves. We can't do it alone. And yes, people go to wildlife sanctuaries to see tigers because you don't see tigers around your house. But then there are other wildlife. There are smaller wildlife, lesser wildlife, lots of birds. There may be even snakes that can be seen in these places around us. So these things can be, uh, ad can be publicized. Again, this is something that the government can be encouraged to do. Publicize the forests around us. Protect them, organize them, publicize them, invite people to come and see them. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dominic. I hope that answered uh, your question. Uh, we have uh, Purna pra pra no, I'm, I'm so sorry if I have misspelled it. Uh, how can we develop the tribal people without urbanization? How can we conserve endemic species? So she has these two questions for you. Okay, endemic species, uh, again, tribal people are part of the natural ecosystem, just like wildlife is. So again, the natural ecosystem, wild forests, wild lands are property of the government and the government is the body or the institution that takes care of them or should take care of them and does. Again, it can, can do with help from private institutions. There are organizations that work with the government, lots of them. CE itself is working with the government. There are also private organizations, private individuals who can help, who can offer their services and offer their uh, knowledge to the government. If, and very often the government is receptive. You may have a little problem sometimes, but then there's a way of working around that and you have to work around. One thing is for sure, you can't do this on your own. You can't go and uh, protect or save tribals on your own because they live in government land, in, in forests, which, are, which belong to the government. Wildlife, local biodiversity, animals around you, they all are property of the government. Every sparrow or crow or snail that comes into your garden is the property of the government. It's not your property just because it's in your garden. It's the property of the government. You can help it, you can protect it, you can enhance it while it's in your garden. But if it's outside, you need, you can do it, yes. You can do what you can what, on your own, you can help. But if you want to do it on a large, effective scale, you have to do it in conjunction with the government. Thank you. Uh, Venkidesh has two questions. Uh, I think he's referring to the ponds and other water bodies that you have shown in your slideshow. So he would like to know, uh, do they recharge the groundwater? And also, um, you refer to the signages, which says uh, there are animals here and humans should not enter. So if he's also asking uh, movement of animals and human in artificial forest. How does that work? So is there anything more uh, that can be done about it? So, Okay, the first part was about groundwater. Does, do the ponds recharge the ground, groundwater? Yes, if they are not lined, if they are ordinary ponds, they're just dug into the ground. Of course, when you store water in any place, it seeps, it percolates into the soil and gets and enters the water table. And so it definitely recharges the groundwater. So what you're doing is you're collecting rainwater, storing it in one place, and pumping it into the ground, percolating it into the ground, so it recharges groundwater. But sometimes if the soil is too porous and you want surface water because that is what brings in the wildlife, that's what sustains your forest, you have to keep water at the surface. At those times, we line the ponds with an inert plastic material, it's expensive, but it lasts long, it holds water. You can't just have a plastic bottom to a pond. So over that plastic lining, you have to put clay so that plants will grow on it and animals will feel comfortable in a natural surrounding. And you fill that pond with water. Now that water will stay for a while, much longer than, a wa than water that is filled in a porous uh, pond. Eventually, of course, it's gonna evaporate, 
that in then it has to be replenished with water either treated water well treated water because water can be treated very in many ways you have to treat the water perfectly 100% before you put it back into the well or you can pump you can use ground water that's available with you that you have surplus of to fill the pond so it's it's both ways you can use ponds to recharge ground water but where you want water standing at the surface you have to make sure that the water doesn't go into the ground you're doing exactly the reverse you prevent water from percolating in so it stays at the surface and serves the wildlife around the second thing was about uh, what was the second question again just the mine what is the second part about snakes coming into working areas i think uh, no, is this right? question is a movement of animals and humans yeah. in artificial forest how does that work it's been working for the last 30 years in the tvs and sundam clayton factories and these are factories where there's a lot of movement of people there's constant movement of people there's movement of vehicles material all sorts of things it's it's a question of discipline one is you don't you see this happens everywhere you don't disturb boy life they don't disturb you 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 keep away from the forest create the forest let it serve its purpose you stay in your working area and if something comes into your working area you don't kill it you don't otherwise you're defeat, defeating your own purpose you have to capture that i i showed you a picture where snakes when they wander into factory working areas they captured there are trained staff in the factories you have to train your staff to capture snakes without danger to yourself or to the snakes and release them safely back into your forest or a forest outside if you don't have enough space but how how to manage man and wildlife in a restricted place it's a question of discipline on the part of people and it automatically happens with wildlife because animals don't prefer to move in disturbed areas no one prefer to move in areas where there's a lot of footfall a lot of people movement lights noise they stay away so you by your activity you're automatically keeping wildlife away and by your own consciousness you keep yourself away from the wildlife unless of course you want to go in and see them that's different then of that's a different thing you want to do bird watching you want to see the ponds you want to enjoy nature you go in there and it is not a place where you are entering the lions den forests are safe whether it's your own forest or it's a, it's a forest outside they are safe as long as you follow the rules of the forest there are unwritten rules which you follow can you follow those rules because animals all follow the rules it's only people that disobey rules when you disobey rules you run into trouble animals don't disobey rules even snakes that wander into your working areas or factories they're doing that they're just checking they're foraging they're looking out and if you capture them gently and put them back they they don't they, they're happy to do, to go back sometimes they they come to these areas because sometimes you see if it's very wet or it's very hot or it's very dry they're looking for uh, sustenance so they come into areas where your factory has water your factory has shelter it's cool inside your factory buildings or inside your house so they'll come in there but it doesn't mean to say that they're coming there to kill you you capture them gently and put them out again there's no training required here it's just following natural laws thank you there are around uh, 20 questions i think uh, it's going to take a lot of time so i'll just ask one more to you and then uh, we will send you the questions and we can uh, share it with the participants uh, through our website and our pages sure. so one sure. question uh, that uh, it's a very interesting question so um, bhuvana would like to know what are the unique indicators that an area is successfully restored i can ask that along with rupali's question which is uh, what are the challenges when we come up with such an initiative the indicator i told you one indicator is well obviously if you if you have a green forest in your backyard you're doing something right if animals come in there you're doing something more that's right if they start breeding in there you got it made you're doing absolutely the right things you you then you you need do nothing more you've got the entire thing from top to bottom perfect so these are indicators indications that you are doing the right thing how do you your second question was what are the issues involved Is that challenges. right? Challenges. Yeah. Okay. What are the challenges? Involved? Yeah. Well, challenges. One challenge we already addressed: the business, that business of animals coming into your house. If you have a nice forest in your backyard, or a, even a thick, a dense garden, you're going to have creatures coming out from there. You may have frogs getting into your bathroom. You may have earthworms coming into your room. You may have snakes entering. And especially if you have, sometimes you know, rats often accompany people because we leave food lying around. We leave debris and rubbish lying around. Rats live in them. They feed off them. snakes come for the rats so you'll be bringing snakes close to you so the way to do it is you 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 build your little ecosystem 
but you keep yourself safe by ensuring that you don't make your living areas attractive to the to the wildlife that's what we do in the for in the factories and if they do come in there gently put them back it is it, it's not an issue it's not a, a major issue because most of the time they'll stay away because they don't want to come near you and wildlife don't like people because they know that people harm them man is the most feared organism on earth all animals and creatures are afraid of man they like to stay away but if you attract them by giving them good homes by by putting out food for example if you put out food naturally animals will come you can't expect an animal not to come if you put out food for them we put out uh, you know bird baths and little feeding trays for birds you get birds coming there but if you get something like snakes coming in well it means perhaps that you have got hiding places for snakes around your house you probably got rats living in those in just outside your house and you need to eradicate those you need to clear up the place you need to make sure there are no rats around and that, that way you can keep the potentially dangerous but not otherwise dangerous animals away they are not really issues because it's not like you need not think that if you have a little garden at home you're going to have you're going to be in deadly danger from a wildlife that comes there it doesn't happen that way one last question uh, yeah. bharat is asking uh, like if we have a free space like i don't want to rewild it uh, what is the step way to go is there consulting books related to it and so what are your tips and uh, advice to them it depends on the in- extent or the intensity of the rewilding that you want to do if you have a little backyard just a garden there's no issue it's it's very simple you just plant your or the, uh, but plant the right kind of plants plant native plants not exotics very often we go in for exotics because they grow fast or they they look pretty or they have and they have nice big flowers but remember very often these exotic plants or hybrid flowers are useless to wildlife because they don't they have no nectar and the hybrid flowers have very little nectar so although they may look showy they're useless to the local wildlife so what you need to do is plant the right stuff in your little garden if you have a bigger place you don't really need to work on it very often just leaving the place alone protecting it making sure no disturbance gets in is enough forest and wildlife vegetation springs up on its own wherever it's allowed to wherever you allow nature and wildlife to live it will thrive the problem is we don't allow that we clear up we mow we we put insecticide we put fertilizer and stuff like that you can do that for your garden of course but if you want to have a wild area if you want to do rewilding in a small or large place don't put all these things in they not they should not be done you make sure that you first protect the area secondly don't go and don't disturb it thirdly what if you have to go in there make sure you go in there at very very little don't go in there all the time even if it's to do work make sure that you do your little work as fast as possible come away of course if you want to enjoy it then you make sure that you follow certain rules follow paths don't go into don't bulldoze your way into the forest to the wildlife all the time walk long paths walk unobtrusively wear the right kind of clothing walk quietly these are all little rules and regulations that help you to see wildlife better without disturbing the environment so you can build an environment a nice little wildlife uh, you can rewild a little place of your own or outside your place you can make it successful you can go in there and enjoy it but you must follow these simple rules thank you thank you so much sir so there are many more questions so to all the participants who have asked question please uh, don't feel that your questions are not answered we will uh, get the answers from uh, mr preston and also our uh, team uh, at ce and we will get back to you with all the answers so just give us uh, one or two days time for that and uh, uh, madhavi ma'am anything uh, you any particular questions uh, your team ready anyone otherwise uh, i think we will send them the responses only oh, okay. because we i think are running out of time so so a big uh, big thanks to you uh, sir uh, for uh, giving your time to all our participants today there is really You're enriching welcome. so now we know it is not about the government or we wait for hundreds of years but uh, we can have a small forest it's like you even even if i think i can have a small forest uh, in my backyard so uh, so that, that is a hope that you have given us through this session so i think all our uh, participants also uh, have uh, really learned from you and also to brijula and uh, rajni uh, thank you so much uh, for all the information and uh, so i'll just like to uh, inform all the participants here 
So CE Academy, uh, our course here, uh, Ecosystem Restoration Certificate course, uh, it's been started uh, last month and we have already completed our course in uh, oceans and uh, coast and oceans. So this is the current uh, on forest. We will have four sessions. This is the opening session and we have three more uh, sessions to go in forest. That will be followed by another five. We have farmland, uh, grasslands, then urban areas, lakes and rivers and mountains also coming up. So you may join uh, any one in particular which is of your interest or you can join the entire course that will give you a holistic understanding of all the uh, different ecosystems. So I you have already posted all the links on the chat and also your email ID is given. So I request you all to go through uh, the program and register for uh, the module that interests you or I rather suggest that you join the entire course that will really give you uh, overall understanding. So. And all the participants who have already joined who are with us uh, from the uh, the first module that is oceans so um, we will uh, you will all will be here of, of course uh, we'll share the link and you'll be here with us uh, for the next talk and also for, uh, for the new participants i request all of you to join the course so and a big thanks to all of you for joining us today we have seen more than 100 participants today so that is really seeing uh, the interest people have in this particular course and forest in particular so that is really good so let's uh, that's really interesting. I, big thanks to all of you for joining us uh, this evening. And Madhvi ma'am for leading us. Sanskriti, mm -hmm. you're here. Thank you. And uh, Rajri, Vrijlal, all, all of you for all uh, the effort. Jairaj, thanks to you as well for all the support. Charmin. Mm -hmm. So uh, anybody have any any anything particular to announce or to say? Otherwise, we can wind up today's session. Meena, uh, I think for the panelists and including uh, uh, Preston, uh, just stay back a bit. I think we can close the session now and uh, look forward uh, to all the participants also joining the course and uh, having look, looking forward to the interaction. Thank you, Preston, from the entire team for this one. You're session. very welcome. So I just request the panelists, including yourself, Preston, to, to stay back for a bit. Sure. Ma'am, you're mute. Yes. <laughs> Come oh, okay, here. sorry. <laughs> yeah, just a group photo if somebody can take it. Uh, that's it. Also. So, who's taking a group? Vidla or Dina? No. I'm taking it. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Done. I have taken it. Thanks, thanks. Okay, thanks. Thank okay. you very much. <laughs> All right, we are so done. Was now. Yeah. All right. Bye bye, everyone. Bye, Preston. Thank, thank you very again. much, sir. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. All the best. Thank you.